thank you, Craig, for the uh, humorous yet uh, kind introduction. Um, just for the record, my uh, name contains 66.66% vowels, if you care to comment. <laughs> So, but it's not about vowels that I would like to talk to you today. Um, and uh, it is about a certain um, aspect of our uh, research that involves the uh, understanding of how DNA uh, molecules move locally and globally to uh, perform their um, amazing biological activity. Um, and uh, uh, before I talk about that, uh, because this is a larger departmental talk, I thought to present first um, what um, are we interested in general, uh, the tools that we use, and the kind of techniques that we employ. So in a more, in a, the most general sense, we're interested in um, uh, the uh, description of uh, biomolecular dynamics. So consider an Erlenmeyer flask like this one with um, on the order of 10 to the 23 molecules inside it. We would like to understand how one or a few molecules in there move at the atomic level. So um, in order to do that, we achieve what I teach in um, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics at the graduate level, and I'm happy to see that some of the students in um, those classes are here. We basically offer a statistical mechanical picture, a microscopic picture of the macroscopic thermodynamics of, uh, of solutions. And um, the chemical systems of uh, interest here are rather complex. They involve a large number of atoms that interact through covalent and non-covalent interactions. And these interactions takes place at a wide distributions of time, length, and energy scales, which makes the um, uh, uh, problem um, at hand not, um, not too easy. And the fact that it's a difficult question, so the problem is, um, relatively difficult, difficult enough to warrant the award last year of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the development of computational techniques that address the multi-scale nature of the chemical systems involved in such um, uh, instances, in biomolecular instances. So, okay, so this is what we're interested in. Um, what do we actually do in order to simulate the dynamics? We don't do much more than uh, basically integrate Newton's equations of motion in time. This uh, involves calculating the force on all the atoms in the molecule. So you saw here uh, a number of atoms wiggling and jiggling. And why do they wiggle and jiggle? Because there's a force on each of them, and the force on each of them comes from the gradient of a potential. What potential? It's an empirical potential. It's the potential for which the Nobel Prize has been awarded. And it involves very simple considerations. When you have two atoms that are covalently bonded, right, through a, through a covalent chemical bond, we describe this as putting a spring between the two atoms, right? So if you squeeze the spring, the energy goes up. If you extend the spring, the energy will also go up, and it does so harmonically. So we have a potential energy term that's harmonic in the bond. When we have an angle that's formed by three atoms um, that are pairwise, uh, this with this and this with the other one connected covalently, right? the angle can fluctuate. And if you squeeze the angle, the energy will go up. And if you uh, extend the angle, it will also go up harmonically. So we have a harmonic angle term. Um, if we rotate um, the leftmost atom and the rightmost atom around the bond created by the central two atoms, between the central two atoms, this is called the dihedral angle. You can almost see it. It's the angle between the plane passing through these three atoms and the plane passing through these three atoms. This, these two planes make a dihedral, and that dihedral has a potential energy associated with it that oscillates in the first approximation periodically. So that's another term in the potential. Two atoms can also interact if they don't are necessarily directly related by bonds and angles through space. And that interaction is either modeled 
as a van der Waals interaction or as an electrostatic interaction where each atom has a little charge on it um, that again is calculated as a parameter of this otherwise empirical model. We call this an empirical model because it is not uh, a solution of the Schrodinger equation, right? We fit these constants, the spring constant of the bond, the spring constant and the angle, the, the, the curvature in the bottom and the tops of the uh, harmonic dihedral potential, the A's and B's in the Leonard Jones interactions describing Van der Waals interaction and repulsion, and the charges Q1 and Q2 of two atoms that interact uh, via electrostatic interaction. All these parameters come from either experiment or a more careful quantum mechanical calculation. But at the end of the day, for, for each atom in the simulation, we have a force, right? So that force is going to move the atom, and it's going to move it according to Newton's equation of motion. It'll um, um, move it such that the time derivative of the acceler the, the time derivative of the velocity, which is the acceleration, with, will change in a manner that's proportional to the force, and that from the velocity being the temp time derivative of the position, you can calculate position. So we basically, by integrating, uh, by solving this Newton equation of motion, we get the position and the velocity of all the atoms of, at all those times. And those positions are basically uh, shown here. They are a uh, time sequence of events. They are, they are making a molecular movie. The atom is at a different position at each time. Where does that position come from? The solution of the Newtonian equations of motion. So um, you may say, well, this is um, relatively trivial. It's a simple classical equation of motion. We just need to solve it, and then we'll get everything. But how exactly do you get everything, and what does everything mean? Well, we're interested in thermodynamics, not per se in the dynamics of the molecule, and we're interested in the thermodynamics by definition. This means for 10 to the 23 molecules, but we've only simulated one. So in order to get to extract the thermodynamics from the microscopic simulation of one temperature, we have to be able to use the tools of statistical mechanics to relate a microscopic picture, a time-dependent picture, to an ensemble picture. But even that is not sufficient because um, when you actually integrate the equations of motion, and the equations of motions are integrated not on um, a laptop such as this one, but on many uh, CPUs that um, work in parallel and communicate to each other, uh, these are called um, uh, large-scale uh, parallel computing. So the, each CPU calculates the positions and the forces of some of the system and communicates with each other to pass on the forces, velocities, and positions. And in the end, we're able to um, solve problems. We're able to show movies on the time scale, say, of microseconds of the real life of that molecule. And that, that takes us in, um, you know, in excess of... Uh, when, when we calculate uh, all the systems that we do and everything that we're interested in, we use of the order of 100,000 CPU days per year, um, which is to, compared with the number of days of brain, uh, the number of brain days we uh, maximally can use a year. So my students should uh, be uh, uh, attentive. In two years, we'll be able to have an extra day, right, as we did in 2012, because it's a leap year. So on, on the um, development side, I should say that uh, half of our work is using just pen and papers and erasers. Erasers are important. <laughs> the uh, reason we need that is because, I said, we can make these movies on the microsecond time scale. Okay? Um, but very uh, important molecular biology, as some of you know, takes place on the millisecond to second time scale. And that we cannot simulate directly, so we need new methods that extend the reach of the uh, kinetical and relaxation properties that we can um, um, uh, simulate in, in the computer. Uh, um, however, today I won't talk about the theoretical methods development. Instead, what I will do is to walk you through a zoo of uh, systems that undergo what is to me exciting, uh, uh, molecular gymnastics that involves um, 
deoxyribonucleic acids, DNA molecules. So, um, and we will do this um, at the um, um, local scale first, and then we will talk about global such conformational transitions. But why are we interested in DNA gymnastics to, to start with? Well, um, according to the textbook uh, basics of the, of the DNA descriptions, um, we have um, four kinds of bases, A, T, C, G, and um, we have unique ways of pairing uh, A and T and C and G. Um, although what exactly we define by unique, we will see later. Um, so the canonical picture of DNA, the one you always see in molecular biology textbooks, is that of a perfect double helical strand with A pairing with T always like this and C pairing with G always like this. So you have two hydrogen bonds here and three hydrogen bonds. And um, that's, uh, that's, that's fundamentally the description at, at the, of, of DNA um, on the local scale. But on the global scale, DNA is much more exciting. Um, it behaves very much like a telephone cord. Right? If you think that your telephone cord has two wires in it, they are the two strands, let's say, and um, you take that uh, telephone cord and you twist one end relative to the other, what you will see is that uh, you produce what are called super coils. So in, in addition to the coil of the telephone cord, you have a coil of coils. The helical axis of the coil coils around itself. So you have then um, super coils like this. Uh, moreover, you have very complex um, uh, squeezed geometries of DNA. And we're interested in all these contorted states for two reasons. First is a fundamental molecular biology reason. For example, DNA in uh, genes is wrapped around proteins that are called nucleosomes. And they are very tightly wrapped, much, tight, much tighter wrapped than it is possible to bend the DNA without the protein. Um, moreover, if a certain gene is to be repressed, you, you want to suppress the expression of a certain gene, you don't want to make a certain kind of protein, well, the DNA that codes for that protein is looped. So if you loop it, then you repress the expression of that gene intervening between the two points that touch each other when you loop the DNA. So it's a very fundamental genetic transaction. Moreover, uh, DNA, the two strands of the DNA, are unzipped. One is peeled off from the other, so the hydrogen bonds are destroyed during the process of DNA replication, right, where one st strand of the DNA serves as a, as a template for the replication of new DNA. Even um, furthermore, DNA is tightly squeezed into the um, capsids of viruses at a pressure that exceeds 10 times the pressure of a champagne bottle. So the geometries that occur there are very far away from the canonical textbook picture of double-stranded DNA. So when we think of DNA, we should think, at least at the global scale, um, as being more like these nautical knots that you see here, rather than the straight um, uh, situation presented in uh, typical uh, introductory descriptions. Um, there are also exciting new applications in the realm of biotechnology. For example, we can design nanomechanical devices. We can use the energy stored in the um, uh, super coils, right? Remember I said that you take a telephone cord and you super coil. There's energy stored there, and similarly you can store energy, and perhaps you can make DNA nanopropellers that will push themselves through the solution of a biological or nanotechnological application to, to target a specific um, region in, in that um, application. Moreover, we can make, um, not we, we as a community in general, it is possible to make nanopores out of DNA that mimic the nanopores that uh, are made by proteins. These are um, hollow, uh, uh, roughly cylinders that penetrate the lipid bilayer of cells and serve as an opportunity to shove things around through the hole, for example, to perform um, individualized gene therapy. You can push DNA inside the, the cell through the bilayer lipid of membranes. 
So there are, there's, there, are, there are exciting opportunities um, and uh, challenges at the same time in studying the, uh, the, the, the conformational transitions of contorted DNA. And uh, the plan of the talk is to go through these opportunities and challenges and starting at the local DNA level, we will see why is it important to understand the uh, way in which bases move relative to each other in the double helix. Then I will talk about the removal of the supercoils of DNA. How is that catalyzed by enzymes called topoisomerases? And then go into the realm of nanotechnology and talk about how dendrimers condense DNA and uh, what are the forces, uh, the characteristic forces and processes at play. And lastly, I will talk about the way in which DNA gets out and goes into the viral capsids um, to uh, um, undergo viral import and ejection. So let's start with the story. Um, we will discuss the local DNA gymnastics uh, involving flipping out DNA bases. Um, in the uh, 50s, at King's uh, College, um, uh, Rosalind Franklin started to produce really detailed um, X-ray photographic pictures of DNA. And um, Linus Pauling, who successfully predicted the geometry of uh, an alpha helix, or not of, of, a, of a DNA, but an alpha helix, took a crack at it and suggested that uh, the uh, pictures that he has not yet seen of Rosalind Franklin, but the, the data that existed up to that point uh, would indicate that the DNA is such that it has three helices, but the sugar phosphate backbone of the helix is inside, and these four things, A, T, C, Gs, the bases are out. Um, while Watson and Crick, being local, have seen the pictures coming out of King's College, and they were able to uh, come up with the um, exact, the real um, uh, model for double helical DNA. That model of Watson and Crick uh, shows that there are these two backbones made of sugars and phosphates repeating periodically, and the DNA bases are inside, and they hydrogen bond with each other on the inside, not on the outside, as Pauling has suggested, having in mind his successful model of an alpha helix. In, alpha hel and in an alpha helix, the situation is opposite. You have the backbone of the protein is inside, and the residues, the amino acid residues, are sticking out into the solution. Right, so Pauling's model was wrong, and um, the uh, paper went into the hall of shame of uh, uh, theoretical molecular biology, or so it seems. Because um, what happened in, um, uh, by the way, it, uh, tracing back, the story is much more exciting than, than I told, told it, the, the Pauling versus Watson and Crick. And so I uh, recommend that, that you read on it. Um, the, uh, the novel experiments involved uh, are of the single molecule type, and they involve tweezing uh, the DNA at the single molecule level. And they suggest that there is an abrupt transition in which DNA suddenly elongates by 70% of what it is in the so-called BDNA state. This is uh, roughly the Watson and Crick model. So why is that? First of all, what are these experiments? These experiments employ either magnetic beads, as shown here. You have a, a magnetic bead that attaches to a double-stranded DNA. This is just not one strand. It's double-stranded DNA. And because it's magnetic, you can actually twist it. So there is a torque that you can induce on the DNA. And at the same time, you can pull the magnets up and you can apply tension, right? So I have a piece of thread and I can apply tension at its ends and I can twist around it and I can apply torque with these magnetic tweezers. Another kind that this, this was by um, 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 Ben Simon and Croquette in Paris. A similar experiment, but involving optical tweezers, was performed by Carlos Bustamante and his collaborators at Berkeley. Uh, but the idea is the same, to twist and pull DNA. Um, so what we set to do was to analyze in detail what kind of new DNA is seen in the experiment. Why do these experiments see a sudden jolt of extension in DNA that extends it by 70%? 
Uh, and moreover, uh, why is it that they see that when they um, um, add to the solution um, moieties that chop the bases off, they do that. They, they lose the, the DNA loses its bases. So what we set to do was a molecular dynamic simulation. We used those supercomputers that you've seen a couple of slides ago, and we pulled and torqued DNA virtually. So we created a model in which we stacked an initial uh, uh, B-form DNA, and uh, we pulled these two strands up and these two strands down, and we also applied a torque at the end um, at this end and at that end. As you can see, there is a transition from a BDNA state to something that looks like Pauling's original model, where the sugar phosphate backbone is inside and the bases are out. So uh, we can be a little bit more quantitative, quantitative than that and calculate a free energy profile as a function of the uh, of a, of a reaction coordinate that goes from B DNA, from Watson Crick DNA to Pauling DNA. And this free energy profile, the derivative of this free energy profile, will give us the force and the torque on the DNA exactly. So then we can go ahead and, and compute those tensions and torques from the simulation that are showed here. And then we can go and check with existing experimental data. And what you see here is an, an, is an experimentally calibrated force versus torque phase diagram. Okay, so this, uh, if you want to think in terms of um, uh, thermodynamics, this could be like a clausius clapper on phase diagram where you see a solid, liquid, and vapor, right, for example. Anyway, here, um, the the, the bottom line is that the calculations, which are showed in, in red, actually go very well through the phase diagram that um, uh, predicts a separation between a B-like DNA, Watson Crick, and the P-like DNA. And we see that the transition occurs very close to a critical point, which is the minimum point uh, below which the transition cannot go. So that was a fairly rewarding application of a computer exercise in calculating the potential of mean force. The simulations were in um, good accord with the uh, were in accord with the experiments um, that are that were performed uh, on the same kind of uh, molecules. Please interrupt me with questions anytime. Okay, so that was flipping over. What happened was that the DNA base pairs, they were hydrogen bonded with each other, and then because I twist and pull, it's only natural, you'll think, right, that the DNA flips out, and that's basically confirmed by the simulation. But now we want to see another instance of flipping, this time uh, not flipping out, but flipping over. So uh, a base is, uh, not, uh, does not have mirror symmetry just like my hand. It's one way to present you the, uh, this side, right, of, of, of my hand, and that's another situation if I, pre if I flip the base over, right? There's a question uh, before we talk about flipping over. the P-state of the DNA is P-state? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so to pre preface it, let's uh, go here. Um, the, uh, there are various uh, DNA forms. This, this Watson Crick uh, base pair, but they can uh, behave differently. They can, uh, from the top view, they can look like this, or they can look like this, or they can even look um, in a way in which the uh, the right-handed coil is left-handed. That's called ZDNA. And all these conditions are physiological, can, can be physiological, and they are mediated either by proteins that bind to the DNA or by a change in the solution uh, surrounding DNA. Here, PDNA does not exist. So it's not a total vindication of Pauling. Uh, it's not that I will ever see a PDNA uh, situation like this in solution. It only appears, it, it, there, there, you know, it has some high free energy, 
but uh, that is lowered only when you apply forces and torque. So only in a situation where you pull and twist DNA can you uh, stabilize this form. So uh, uh, again, Pauling's vindication, well, partially because uh, of this. Yes. So uh, it turns out that uh, the the um, uh, because I was um, a student of a postdoctoral student of Martin Karplus, the Nobel Prize winner of last year, and Karplus was a graduate student of Pauling. My student at Michigan, Jeff Verschinski, who is now at the Illinois Institute of Technology, was very happy that he was able to uh, vindicate his great-grandfather, scientifically speaking. But that, again, it's only a partial vindication for at least an, another reason. Pauling's model had three helices of DNA, not two. The three, bond, three strands of DNA, not two, in one helix. Okay? So, um, so okay, so, we, so that was a study on the uh, flip over of um, a flip out of DNA bases. But what happens to, uh, to DNA when you flip it out? So, um, as I said, um, A is um, binding with T and, and they're, they're binding through these hydrogen bonds. But, uh, and, and C involves three hydrogen bonds. So, let's um, make this akin to. The way in which um, these uh, two ballet dancers um, hold on to each other. They, um, they grip um, at three points, right? And um, in principle, so, but notice the pose of the ballerina. She is uh, facing towards you. There's another possibility in which this time only two hydrogen bonds are created, but this time the ballerina is facing uh, the back. So her back is facing you. This involves a flip over, okay? Moreover, note that the right hand of uh, this performer grabs the right hand of this performer, but here his right hand grabs her left hand. So there is a change in the acceptor donor pair that hydrogen bonds. In other words, um, it involves a flip over, but at the same time a rearrangement of the acceptor and donor positions of the two bases. In a closer look, and, and that um, alternative hydrogen bonding pattern is called the Hookstein um, uh, pattern after the uh, scientist who uh, looked at this problem. So for example, in a Watson Crick situation shown here in the upper left side, um, you have an AT uh, uh, double, uh, two, two hydrogen bonds, uh, but then in a Hookstein base pair you see that um, this um, uh, five-member ring actually flips over and you produce a new hydrogen bond that didn't exist before. Similarly here, you have three hydrogen bonds. One is maintained and two other, and, and, and a new one, two are destroyed and a new one is created, okay? Uh, this is just a simplified view. There are, there are many more situations that you can create because you have more possibilities for acceptor donor pairs. But this is the simplest situation and um, it is exciting because uh, the existence of Hookstein base pairs is not, new, is not news. It has, exist, it has been predicted and, and, and seen many times before, but it has always been seen in contexts in which the, a protein binds DNA and deforms it severely. The Hookstein base pair has never been seen in what we call naked DNA, which means DNA in the solution in the absence of protein. Not been seen until very recently when my um, collaborator, um, Hashim Al-Hashimi, then at the University of Michigan and now at Duke University, has seen in a liquid state NMR experiment the existence of a very uh, low populated, one in a hundred relative to the Watson Creek, a very low populated Hookston uh, uh, population uh, that lived on the millisecond time scale. And so what we said to do in collaboration with him was to create a movie, a transition between uh, the Watson Creek and the Hookston. And you see it here in uh, its uh, details of hydrogen bonding. Okay, so we flip uh, uh, the base over back and forth uh, between Watson Creek 
and Hookstein. Okay, uh, quiz. Can you tell me if it's an AT or a CG? Look at the, in the initial and the final number of base of uh, hydrogen bonds. There are two for each, right? So it's an AT base pair. Okay, um, so, so these are the kind of things that we can uh, do. We can study the thermodynamics and the transitions uh, between local properties of DNA that are important either for understanding novel single molecule experiments or for uh, understanding the thermodynamics and kinetics of liquid state NMR populations. Um, next, I will uh, talk about three more things. So I will walk you through uh, the zoo and show you three more animals. First will be um, topoisomerase interacting with DNA and removing its supercoils. Secondly, I will talk about man-made dendrimers interacting with DNA. So this will involve uh, calculations of uh, how these dendrimers compact DNA. And lastly, I will talk about DNA inside a virus. That would be how much time left? 25, okay. So um, this is an actual uh, picture of the supercoiling state of DNA. Okay, so re remember with the uh, uh, telephone cord analogy in mind, um, this is uh, not supercoiled. And here it's more and more supercoiled. So imagine that you have the supercoiled and circular DNA. We have to keep it circular. We have to talk about it being circular. Not necessarily. You can also uh, talk about DNA that's not circular, but its ends are relatively uh, fixed uh, uh, relative to the motion of the, uh, the supercoil between those two ends. So um, how can you obtain uh, from a supercoil DNA, uh, non-supercoiled DNA, unless you do something to your DNA? You cannot really, right? So imagine you have two rubber bands and you twist them one around the other. First they will make a coil, one will coil around the other, then you keep, you keep coiling, then you have a coil of coil, so you have a super coil, right? And now imagine that you put together the two ends on which you grab, right? You have uh, circular DNA, no matter what you do to the DNA, you cannot reduce its so-called linking number, the number of times that the DNA crosses over itself, and plus the number of times the helical axis crosses over itself, is what's called the topological invariant. No matter what you do to a topologically sound DNA, you cannot do it. But if you nick DNA, so imagine that you come with scissors and you nick not both, but one, not both, but one of the strands, right, of the rubber bands, what will happen with the nicked strand is that it'll rotate around the other and it will release supercoils. Well, that's exactly what um, top y isomerases do. The, uh, the binding involves a covalent formation of a bond between the sugar phosphate backbone and the protein, and the cut DNA downstream of the cut rotates, and the number of times it rotates is the number of supercoils it releases. So the uh, situation is pretty much like this movie produced by uh, my collaborator Ninke Decker at uh, Delft University at that time. All my collaborators seem to move, including myself. So um, the, uh, the movie here shows the Pac-Man-like enzyme, the blue thing, that binds to double-stranded DNA that supercoils. So you see here the supercoils are downstream. So what happens is, first of all, there's a cut of one strand, and the energy stored in the DNA serves as the source to produce the rotation of the cut uh, duplex around, uh, uh, pi uh, pivoting around the intact one, okay? So that's, um, that's the idea. How do we know that this is so, and how, moreover, how can we measure it? Before, we, before I show you how this was actually measured and how real time, um, the, and how the kinetics of this process was obtained in real time, let me tell you that we can actually simulate this because there exist crystal structures of the protein in contact with uh, the DNA. So 
um, in this particular uh, work, which was uh, done uh, with uh, Jeff Vereschinski and my former postdoc, Levin Sari, who is now associate dean at, uh, uh, in, um, uh, at Fatih University in Istanbul, was a computer simulation in which we placed double-stranded DNA inside the grab of the Pac-Man-like enzyme. So here you see the enzyme this time is in green with some of its domains colored in red and the DNA is in yellow. Now, uh, what we do is to calculate the potential of mean force for this rotation. It's basically a free energy profile along the rotational degree of freedom. Um, and um, the, the quantities needed are recorded and we can calculate the potential of mean force. So if we do that um, there, then what is this? Well, this is the same thing, but uh, this time, if you notice, the DNA rotates in the other direction. The reason is because along the helical axis, DNA has broken rotational symmetry. So it's one way to twist the DNA along its grain it will produce what are called positive supercoils. And it's another way to rotate the DNA against its grain. You will produce negative supercoils. And those positive and negative supercoils are indiscernible at the level of a few base pairs. So when the enzymes bind there, it, the DNA will rotate into different, two different directions, but the enzyme itself is not uh, central, is symmetrical with respect to the helical axis. So uh, with some gore, I, give, I offer you a, an analogy that involves pushing a, a piece of meat inside the meat grinder. The meat grinder, the DNA, has a helical coil, right? So it's one way if, we, if you twist the DNA of the meat grinder in one direction, the meat will respond in one way and the meat will respond in the other way if you rotate the meat grinder in the opposite direction. In short, what the protein sees from the side of the DNA is different if you rotate positive and negative supercoiling. And this is the kind of insight that simulations can give because up to the point when we started to do this, people thought that the positive and negative supercoils are um, released uh, uh, similarly by the enzyme. And the calculation of the uh, uh, profile, free energy profile showed differently. I'll return to that but let me first tell you what the experiments are uh, uh, about. What Aninke did was to attach uh, magnetic beads at the end of the DNA and actually, just like in my example, supercoil the telephone cord. Well, here is to supercoil the DNA double strand. So twisting the magnet around, she was able to twist the bead, which in turn produced supercoils. And then the enzymes were released, and one at a time, the enzyme removed one supercoil after another. Each time a supercoil was removed, because there, there was tension upwards on the magnetic bead, a jolt was felt in the measurement apparatus. So in other words, the number of jolts is equal to the number of times the DNA has rotated, which is equal to the number of times um, the topoisomerase performed its enzymatic function. So divided by unit time, this will give you the rate of the kinetics involved in, in DNA supercoil relaxation, measured one molecule at a time. And so with kinetics in hand and the calculation of this free energy profile, we can compare simulation and experiment. Plotted here is the free energy profile on the ordinate versus the rotation angle on the abscissa. So you see here 0, 180, 360. This is a complete rotation. You see minima at multiples of 2 pi, and you see barriers at multiples of pi. This means that the DNA diffuses and jumps over the barriers, and it's going downward, which means that relaxation of the supercoil is facilitated. And the height of the barrier is going to dictate what the rate of the conformational transition for one supercoil removal is going to be. So we can estimate that rate from the calculation, and we can compare with the rate that's measured in the experiment. Okay? Um, I won't talk about what the two curves are. You can also do this with uh, an, an anti-cancer drug. If you can inhibit top isomerase, you can stop DNA replication. So that has medical applications. Okay? So uh, 
that's, that, that's the result of supercoil removal. But that's only in the positive axis. In the negative axis, we have the relaxation of negative supercoils. And there you see that the barriers are different and we can actually calculate those. And since the simulation has been done, there appeared uh, an experimental measure in which um, uh, the hypothesis that positive versus negative supercoils are uh, different has been confirmed. So that was the story about um, how torque um, uh, applied to the DNA can produce supercoils and how enzymes release those supercoils uh, via a comparison of simulation and experiment. Next comes a story about the uh, interaction between man-made nanoparticles, dendrimers, PAMAM dendrimers, so-called, and condensed DNA. Here you see an uh, AFM picture of uh, what uh, I would call naked DNA, it means DNA, of course, it's not really in solution, but you can think of it as, as that, that's how it would exist here. It's absorbed on the surface of some uh, uh, material so that it can be visualized. Um, here, it, it doesn't have too many um, nanoparticles. The nanoparticles are these white dots. I will tell you later what they are. If you keep increasing the concentration of those nanodots, the DNA will compact. So now it will look like this, which is in volume a thousand times smaller than the volume of this object. So you have a very efficient way of compacting DNA. And in a compact state, this is useful to uh, deliver it in a compact state if you want it to pass the uh, lipid bilayer barrier. OK. This compact state of DNA can be measured experimentally with single molecule tweezers. So what you can do is you can uh, grab the ends of this DNA and pull them apart at the same time as measure at, at different concentrations of uh, the dendrimer. These dendrimers are uh, branched uh, particles like this. Uh, you have a central moiety that branches in two. That's generation zero. That that. Those terminations branch in two, so you have generation one. The ends of generation one branch in two, so you have generation three, and so on and so forth. So you keep increasing the number of uh, bifurcations at the end of each dendron of each branch. And uh, that's, uh, each time you do that, you increase by one generation. So um, here is what is measured in the um, experiment. Uh, typically, uh, force versus extension profiles are shown. So um, you see here that as I extend the DNA, the force will increase. Then, then a curious force profile will be reached. Then uh, the force will increase abruptly. That's in the presence of dendrimers. In the absence of dendrimers, the force um, starts, to, starts to kick in at um, about 6 micrometers uh, um, length of the DNA, when pretty much the entire DNA is pulled taut. And so what this slope is, is, is feeling the, the elasticity of uh, completely taut DNA. But here, there's something else going on. There's a plateau, and if you um, are in my uh, thermodynamics class right now for the people in the back, we're talking about phase transition. Well, this is an example of a Small, small thermodynamic system phase transition because it involves the coexistence between a condensed phase and an extended phase. And this, is, this force plateau is pretty much like the pressure plateau that you have in pressure versus volume coordinates in typical discussions of the gas to liquid transition for real gases. So what happens is that you start with condensed DNA, you have a coexistence with extended DNA, now all the DNA is extended and you pull it taut. OK, now, with this pressure versus volume uh, diagram in mind, which is akin to the force extension diagram, uh, let's go a little bit further. So the force versus extension diagram is very well described by this equation. This is force, F versus extension, X. It's some, just a mathematical formula that involves a key parameter called the persistence length. You don't have to know what this is. It's the decay. Uh, length of some uh, 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 tangent tangent correlation function. It describes very well this force versus extension, the um, profile of uh, 
naked DNA. But it does not describe the profile of the extension versus force in the case of dendrimer condensed DNA. And that's reminiscent of the ideal gas versus real gas situation. What did van der Waals need to do in order to get an, a flat um, uh, pressure versus ver uh, volume coexistence curve uh, out of the um, ideal gas law? That's exactly what we will have to do to get out of the force extension curve um, modeled by the so-called worm-like chain model to get the real um, situation in the presence of dendrimers. What van der Waals did have to introduce were two parameters, A and B, that describes the microscopics of real gases, excluded volume and attraction. So similarly here, we'll have to do the microscopics, well, for us, mesoscopics, really, of the dendrimer DNA interaction, because now we have that interaction to describe. So that is done via molecular dynamic simulations. We compute the forces of interaction between the dendrimer and the DNA. And, so, and once we compute them, we can build a, a statistical mechanical model for the force versus extension that uh, I won't go into detail, but that reproduces very well the experiment. It doesn't matter which one is which. Blue is the, uh, for the sake of being exact, the blue is the experiment and the black is our simulation. Note here that there is no fit in the uh, simulation. There is no uh, fitting of parameters to get the experiment. The <coughs> simulation gets directly the uh, force extension curve via the calculation of the free energy as a function of the extension. This is supposed to be a quick walk, so I won't go into details. OK, so what did we do? We uh, simulated locally what happens with dendrimers, which are these black dots interacting with DNA, this thread here. And out of that, we extrapolated the macroscopic dynamics that leads to a force extension curve in the pooling apparatus. OK, this is what we've done, what we've done um, in, in this context. So now I will talk about the last topic involving what happens to DNA when it undergoes even more uh, harsh uh, uh, contortions. And that will imply DNA uh, squeezed inside the viral capsids. That will probably uh, give me five more minutes to uh, talk. But I'll need probably five more minutes to talk. OK, so um, you, you probably know the, the details of, of it. You, um, in bacteriophages, um, you have, which are a certain kind of viruses, um, you have a, a, a capsid, you have a shell of uh, proteins. And inside that shell, um, DNA is packed. It's packed at about 60 atmospheres. A good champagne is at about six atmospheres. So this is about 10 times the pressure in a champagne bottle. Um, when DNA gets out of the champagne bottle, it does so through a neck, through a, a called portal pore, which is this reddish um, hole here. And that's also where it goes through when it's packed by a um, biomolecular motor that uh, pushes it around and compacts it. But let's talk about the way it gets out first before talking about, or in, instead of talking about how it gets in. This is a slice through um, a fully, um, uh, a full uh, a viral head. You see that DNA is um, inside here uh, squeezed at incredible uh, compaction and it um, has to get out when it, it when it undergoes infection when, when it infects uh, a, a cell and so it gets out through this ring red ring here that's shown in detail in this slide this is the DNA this is a cut through the so-called portal pore and this is a molecular dynamic setup for a simulation in which we will probe how DNA um, gets out of the viral capsid through this pore. The reason why we became interested in that was 
because um, there existed for a long time in the literature a model that uh, had it that the DNA, when it gets out or in the uh, portal, through the portal port, it actually rotates like a corkscrew uh, would when you, when you push it in the, um, in the cork. Okay, and that uh, had various, uh, that, that was for various reasons, mainly having to do with a symmetry mismatch between the motor that pushes the DNA through and the six-fold, that was five-fold symmetric, and the portal was six-fold symmetric. So the symmetry match, mismatch led people to believe that DNA actually rotates like a coarse crew when it gets in and out of the DNA. When that was tested with um, single molecule um, um, first resonance, uh, spectroscopy with FRET, and two dyes were placed on what is effectively the DNA and what was effectively the portal pore um, with the purpose of seeing a rotation. How would one see a rotation if one puts dyes? Well, if the, um, if the corkscrew model is correct, right, and I place dyes on the DNA as it goes through, there will be a 360 rotation, so one dye will move uh, relative to the other sufficiently that there will be a di distance change that will lead to two colors in the fret uh, measurement. But that kind of color change was not seen. In other words, there was no large motion between the two dyes, which implied that apparently the DNA did not rotate. So that's what we set up to do. We put the DNA inside a, a cryo-EM structure that we fitted with a crystal structure of a monomeric a protein that makes the 12 mer pore. And we did, guess what? Calculated potentials of mean force for the interaction of DNA with the protein. Pro potentials of mean force, this time in two degrees of freedom. One degree of freedom involves the motion of DNA in and out without rotation, let's call this Z. And the other involves rotation of the DNA at constant Z inside the pore. So in other words, we have a potential of mean force in which uh, energy goes up. This is the rotational degree of freedom. This is the translational degree of freedom. Okay, the free energy comes towards you in this plot and when everything is said and done, after about four or five months of uh, computing, we produce this egg rate potential which has minima, maxima, and saddle points. And so if you want to predict, this, this is the central result of the simulation. This result will tell you, will, will, uh, will uh, lead to a model of how DNA goes through. If this is a free energy profile, and if this reaction coordinates are the slowest degrees of freedom, then the minimum free energy path along this profile will be how the system moves. Okay, so if you calculate the minimum free energy pathway, it will be, uh, it will be like a, a connection between these two points, right? I go from one minimum on the egg rate to another via a saddle point, which sits around here. That's the lowest free energy pathway. Well, that predicts at first uh, sight a uh, rotational motion of the DNA because look, this minimum free energy pathway is tilted with respect to the, it's not perpendicular to the rotation, meaning as it translates, the last slide went perhaps a little bit too quickly for you to understand, but you got the, the big picture, right? Um, the, you remember that the mean, uh, that the minimum free energy pathway was tilted, right? Which involved uh, the implication that uh, the DNA will rotate, okay? And actually it's good that I don't have the uh, visual, Eight anymore, I will just use my laptop and imagine that my laptop is the egg rate potential, right? So I have minima in um, the egg rate and this is um, um, rotation and this is translation, right? So you saw that the minimum free energy path involves moving like this. But once you move like this, th that's DNA rotating, right? It'll rotate, but when the, the uh, virus is full, there will be something resisting this rotation, right? You will rotate corkscrew wise against uh, the resistance of a torque inside. But torque couples to um, 
angle, right? So while this was flat before, now because you um, apply torque, torque has the effect to tilt the landscape um, and raise the rotational degree of freedom. So what used to be minimum, now the ball that would roll in the accurate potential hops on, the, um, on your left. And that releases torque, so the free energy surface jumps back until again sufficient torque is built and then the ball falls back and this motion involves a little bit of rotation, sufficient torque builds up, the force, um, the, the, the torque uh, uh, pushes back the, the energy landscape, so you have um, rotation yet you don't. You have local rotation but you don't have global rotation. In other words, the dies move a little bit relative to each other and then they slip back. And that's why you don't see in our interpretation the uh, full rotation of the DNA and this picture is consistent with the measurement of no rotation, uh, no, no major difference in the distance between the dies. Okay, so um, that's pretty much it one thing or not. Um, <laughs> thank you for your attention. Um, what I uh, did to recapitulate was to show local dynamics, DNA bases flipping out, DNA bases flipping over. Then I talked about the relaxation of supercoils, the compaction of DNA, and the um, ejection of DNA from viruses. Thank you for your attention. Don't worry about it. It, it okay. automatically turns off at 5 o'clock, and then it says locked out on the screen. <laughs> Questions? Yes, please. So uh, do you see um, the, the, um, the rotation and then until torque builds up and until it uh, relaxes? Do you see that for DNA entering and also exiting? Um, this discussion is uh, pertinent for um, mostly for um, ejection, okay? When the DNA is pushed inside, um, it is pushed by the, uh, the so-called biomolecular machinery. These are either RNA-based or protein-based biomolecular motors that push it in. Um, but um, the um, interaction between the, the DNA and the pore exists also when the motor pushes it in. We don't have, there is no kinetic data on the import. Pushing in means import of the DNA that we can compare it. So that's why I'm saying that it is more pertinent for ejection for which there are kinetic measurements. In, in those cases, we know from experiments what is the rate of DNA ejection from a relatively full capsid. So in that case, we can compare the rate constant with the barrier height that we compute in the simulation. Right? It will depend exponentially on the barrier height, right? the, the, rate, the rate constant will depend exponentially on the barrier height, so we can, uh, you know, we, we actually put this in a cord. So it's more pertinent for import, for, for ejection, not for import. Yes, Doug? In the double helix, uh, DNA is stabilized typically by interactions with ions, positive ions. Yes. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. So uh, the question um, is like this. The, the sugar phosphate backbone is highly negatively charged. It's minus one at each base, okay? So in the BDNA form, the two uh, phosphate backbones were relatively far apart, but here they're squeezed in. So they will repel more than they did before, which is an additional, um, uh, unstabilizing effect. This is in part one of the reasons why the free energy of this is up in the absence of twist and uh, torque. Um, now, what um, in, in a very different realm, when you have two double helical DNA molecules, they are negatively charged. This is negatively charged, so all they can do is to repel, you may think. However, 
If you put in um, multivalent positive ions in between the two negative DNAs, you can make the DNA molecules attract, the double helical molecules attract, okay? And similarly here, what we have seen in the simulation, this time on the single-stranded DNA, we would see that monovalent ions would hop inside the two, from, from outside will hop inside and facilitate, somehow mediate the interaction between the single-stranded DNA. If that was artifactual or not, and how long they live there, that I, we, we cannot say. But this I can offer in response. So let's thank you one again. Thank you.